Good morning, church. Good morning. <clears throat> How good it is to be back out in the house of the Lord. Lord and I were talking about too long ago, a few days ago. I don't know how people can make it through life without the ability to pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to add to that. I don't know how they can make it through life without the ability to worship and to praise. Our God is good. Mm. All the time. Amen. All the time. Jesus said, in this world, you shall have tribulation. A born again child of God is no stranger to spiritual battles. Mm. We fight them every day. Sometimes we stand, sometimes we fall, but I praise the name of Jesus who always stands and is able to take us by our hand and lift us when we lift it. And so I'm glad to be here with you today. Um, we have a special guest in our midst today. Brother Donnie Coles is here to speak to us and, and tell us about the Gideon Association. And I, for one, am very, very grateful um, for the Gideons and for the work that they do. They make sure that the gospel of Jesus Christ goes out to every person that they can possibly reach. And um, I just want you to know, brother, that uh, the Gideons have the prayers of this church and and you have our hearts. And so, you know the rules here. There are no rules other than follow the Holy Spirit of God. So, we're going to ask Brother Brian to talk. Amen. Thank you. It is good to be back and worship with you folks. Casual conversation, people ask me about the interest I have, and I always share with them about the Gideons and its ministry. I ask, do you know who the Gideons are? The few who know will typically say, oh yeah, you are the Gideons that place the Bibles in the hotel rooms. That certainly is something that we do, and I can tell you that over the years, <coughs> Thousands of lives have been impacted because a Bible was in a hotel room in the time of their need. Recently, a hotel manager in Nicaragua shared the testimony of a beautiful young girl who checked into his hotel. On the first day when housekeeping came to service her room, there was no response. On the second day, it was the same. Upon learning about this, the manager said that if she did not answer the next day, they would need to unlock her door and see if that she was okay. The next morning, the young woman came to the manager and she said, I wish to thank you. I am a Muslim. I'm married. And pregnant. In punishment, my family would stone me to death. I came many miles from home to your hotel to commit suicide. But in my room, I found a Bible placed by the Gideons. For the past two days, I read this book and found the true answer to eternal life through Jesus Christ, and I have accepted him as my Lord and Savior. I am now ready to return to my family and accept my penalty because I have the assurance of spending eternity with Jesus. Each week, Gideons around the world, including in your community, meet for prayer. Besides praying for the work of our ministry, a priority is to pray for the Protestant evangelical churches and assemblies with whom we partner in this community. 
specifically and regularly for this church as well. Secondly, we encourage the church to have an intentional focus on sharing the gospel as the Lord asked us to do. Go make disciples of all nations in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The opportunities are there through our personal testimony. As those who have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, it is our lifestyle to be Christ-like, not just on Sunday mornings, but every moment of our lives. People will want to have what we have, and they'll ask us how to have it. The opportunities are there when we encounter people in need and can share the hope, the joy, and the peace that comes from knowing Christ as Lord. With simple instruction and guidance from the Holy Spirit, that expression of friendship may allow and extend conversation with details <clears throat> on what the Lord has done for you and an opportunity to lead that person to salvation. With planning, the opportunity is there to give an individual a copy of the Word of God. Through the Friends of Gideon's program offered with Gideon Ministry, testaments can be purchased at a discounted price. The same content of the testaments used by the Gideons to share the gospel is included with the section of help topics, with scriptures referenced at the front and the plan of salvation in the back. Ladies and gentlemen, what I have just shared is exactly what the Gideon ministry is all about. We share the gospel through our personal testimony, personal witness, and placing the word of God one by one in the hands of millions of people each year throughout the world. We are an association of born-again Christian business and associated men along with our wives. We are not a Bible producer or a scriptural distribution organization. We are a ministry with a single focus of winning the loss to Christ. Amen. And we do so by partnering with churches just like yours, to reach people around the world. Many come to faith in Christ each year because of this relationship. Let me take you to a country, to the country of Ecuador. Gideons there were offering scriptures to a fifth grade student. They encountered a young boy who did everything he could to cause disruption. Even taking away the testament from students who had received one. The Gideons completed their work the best they could and left for that day. The next year it was time again to return to that school for the new fifth graders. They talked about the disruptive boy and whether they should go back to that school. Through prayer, they discerned they must. When they arrived at that school, that boy was still there. But this time, he came up to say thank you. He told them his father was an alcoholic. He would come home from the bar each evening and attack his wife. The kids would hide or pretend they were asleep to avoid his wrath. But one day, the father found a testament that somehow made it into their home. In reading God's word, he came to accept Christ as a savior. He began to attend church along with his wife and his family, and they had all accepted Christ. The boy was so thankful for the work of the Gideons and how it saved his family. As a ministry, we ask for your prayers. As a ministry, we offer to help you learn how to share your faith and lead the lost to Christ. As a ministry, we encourage you to consider the Friends of Gideon's program to support the Gideons, as well as provide access to testaments. As a ministry, we encourage you to check out the Gideon card display in your foyer. It has free and professional design cards for all occasions where you can honor a friend, a family member, 
or a love walk by setting a card and purchasing scriptures. As a ministry, we encourage born-again business and professional men and their wives who desire fellowship and association with other like-minded believers to learn, to grow, and be encouraged to share your faith by joining our ministry. And as a ministry, we present the opportunity for you to help pay for the millions of scriptures that are distributed each year by the ministry as a gift to the recipient. I have details for you to look at at the table at the back, as well as a basket for your donations this morning to the Gideon City National. We are sincerely grateful, Pastor, for this opportunity to be in your church and for reaching our world for Christ. Thank you. And again, Brother Donnie, we thank you for coming. We thank you. Not just you, but for all of the Gideons, for all of the work and ministry that, that you folks do. Such a blessing. And I would encourage each and every one of you at the end of the service um, to make your donations there in the basket if you so feel led to uh, make a donation uh, to help support the Gideons. Um, uh, there's a basket there on the table. We would love, love for you to, uh, to support that ministry. So this morning I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Acts in chapter number 9. I told Laura last night, or this morning, as we were preparing to leave the house to come here to the church. Throughout the course of the week I study and I pray as often as I would like to, but as much as I can, and I listen to the voice of the Lord, and as I listen, He feeds me, and as He feeds me, I begin to pray, and, and then on Saturday nights, I set up way late in the early hours of the morning studying and praying and going over the things in my heart and my mind that I've studied and prayed about throughout the course of the week. And then it always seems like on Sunday morning when I get up, everything I've studied and prayed about, the Lord kind of changes Amen. on me. And I told Laura this morning, I said, you know what, I'm not staying up until 2 o'clock in the morning anymore on Saturday. I'm just going to get up on Sunday morning and say, Lord, what do you want me to pray? <laughs> but that's okay. I would rather have it that way than any other way. Because really, we came here to hear the word of the Lord, not the word of Pastor Thad, Pastor Mark, and even Donna. We, we've come here today to hear the Lord speak to us. And so, with that in mind, I want you to open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of Acts in chapter number 9. I would ask you this question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Man that saved my life. Amen. Amen. And so many of us can say, He's the man that saved my life. He's the man that saved my soul. He's the man that healed me. He's, he's the one. I think oftentimes, though, we get we familiarize ourselves with the name of Jesus. But just knowing a person's name isn't the same as knowing a person personally. I hope today that every one of us that is in this church or watching over the internet, I hope that you have a personal, up-close relationship with Jesus Christ. So if somebody asks you, who is he, you'll be able to answer that question full and free. If you can't say that, here in just a few moments, we're going to give you an opportunity to come and know who Jesus is. I'm going to read to you just a few verses of Scripture found in chapter number 9. I'm going to read to you about a man named Saul. S-A-U-L. 
Not King Saul. This is another Saul. This is a New Testament Saul. Saul was a Pharisee's Pharisee. He was schooled and trained in the law of God. If you asked him a question concerning the word of God, he wouldn't have to stop and think or ponder or say, I'm going to pray about that. Or when I get home tonight, I'll open up my, my scroll and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll find it for you and get back to you. No, if you ask Saul anything about the law of God, Saul would have been able to just give it to you an answer right off the top of his head. He was zealous for God. And he stood against anything that, in his opinion, rose up against the deity of God. And there was this man from Galilee, his name was Jesus. And he turned this world upside down and set it on his ear. Jesus, the, the Son of God, who came here to bleed and die so that men might be saved. <clears throat> Many people had begun to believe in Him. Many people had begun to trust Him. Multitudes came to Him and He cast out devils. And He healed diseases and He forgave sins. And on several occasions, they would ask Him, Who is this man that He can forgive sin? God, and only God alone can forgive sin not knowing that He was God incarnate, that He was God in the flesh, that He was the prophesied Messiah to come. They tried Him. They took Him and He stood before Pontius Pilate. Pilate fired off all of the questions and according to the scripture, Jesus stood there and spoke not a word. Like a lamb dumb before his shearer. Pilate said, Don't you know that I have the power to save thee alive or to crucify thee? Jesus said, You would have no power over me at all, except it were given to you of my Father. You know, Jesus told the disciples, All power in heaven and in earth has been given unto me. We serve a powerful, powerful Savior who has all authority. They whipped him, they beat him, they nailed him to a cross. As he cried out from the cross, a Roman soldier took a spear and stuck it in his side and the blood and the water flowed out of the body of Jesus Christ. He cried with a loud voice and is finished and he gave up the ghost. They took him down off of the cross and they buried him in a borrowed tomb. Jesus didn't even own any real estate. He, he didn't own a, a plot down at the local cemetery. He was the creator of the world. All things were made by him, and, and without him there was nothing made that was made. That's what the book of John teaches us. He made the earth. Yet he didn't even have a place to call his own. They buried him in. They laid him in a borrowed tomb. On the third day, on the appointed day, according to the scripture, and by the power of the Holy Ghost of God, he resurrected. And he defeated death. And he defeated hell. And he defeated the grave. <laughs> what a mighty God we serve. And he's still defeating death today. And he's still defeating hell. And he's still defeating the grave. He was seen by many. He sat in the upper room with his disciples. He gave them a charge to go ye into all of the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. It's my belief that we need to get back to the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to just preach the truth about who Jesus is. We watched a movie yesterday. For the first time in a long time. In a long time. We had a day. We were so excited, we kept referring to it as our date night. You know how long it's been since I've been able to date my wife? There's always something to do. There's always somewhere to go. There's always someone that needs something, a phone to answer, a text to send. 
kid to take care of, a wedding plan. There's always, 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 always something, always something. I can't tell you when the last time was that we were able to just be me and her. We went to see a movie. It was called The Jesus Revolution. I don't know if you've seen it or not. If you haven't, it's worth seeing. It's based upon a true story by a minister named Chuck Smith. You've probably heard the name Chuck Smith. From the Calvary Chapel out in California. It took place during the late 60s and the early 70s when there was a great Jesus movement. This church filled up with what they called hippies. <clears throat> he met with some he met with some obstacles. He met with church members saying no way. Several of them left. But this minister heard the call of Jesus Christ in his heart. And he shared the gospel with as many people as he could share. And as I was sitting there on my date night with my beautiful wife, eating popcorn, and I was drinking Diet Coke, Rose. <laughs> I heard the Lord speak to my own heart about returning to an old-fashioned preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ to just lift His name and share His power, speak of His authority, and let people know who He is so that churches can be blessed and they can grow, so that the lost can still come and find their soul salvation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Saul, this, this man who had a zeal for God and would stand against anything that lifted itself up against God, thought Christ to be his enemy. He thought the gospel was heresy. And he made it a point to go and find Christians and persecute them. To drag them out of their holes. To throw them into the streets. Many of them stoned to death. A man named Stephen. A disciple of Christ. It was Saul that held the coats for the men. As the men picked up the stones. And stoned Stephen to death. He thought he was doing God's favor. He didn't know who Jesus was. He knew the name. He knew about him. And he had made it a point to take out every Christian, every believer that he could find. He was on his way to Damascus to persecute the church there. And verse number 1 of chapter 9 says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any in this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. He had, he had a mission. His mission was unlike yours and mine. Our mission is to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. His mission was to tear it down. It shows us a spiritual battle that was happening then and it's happening now. Make no mistake, the devil can't stand you. You are made in the image and in the likeness of God. And you bring glory and honor to His name. If Christ is in you and you're in Christ, you bring glory and honor to the name of God. That puts a target on your back. That puts a target on your chest. Every day that you live, you're going to face a spiritual battle. That's just how it is. But praise God that greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Saul is about to learn this. Verse number 3, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, 
Damascus is the place that he was going. He was drawn very near there. Very soon he would carry his plan out. Very soon he would storm Damascus. He would find the Christians. He would bind them. He would bring them back to be judged. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. As he journeyed, as he was on his way, the light of the Lord fell upon Saul, and it shined round about him. You might say, he saw the light. How many of you have ever heard that old gospel song, I saw the light? Amen, that's a good one. You might say in this instance, Saul saw the light. <clears throat> There's something about when the Lord illuminates you. There's something about when the Lord sheds light upon a circumstance or a situation that's in your life. It doesn't matter what your plan was. Your plan gets changed. It doesn't matter what you, where your journey was taking you. Your journey stops. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been or who you are. This man called Jesus can and will and does change everything. And that's hard for us to understand. Even if we're born again believers in Christ Jesus, if somebody asks you, how does this happen? It's the hardest question in the world. Sometimes I have to say, I can't explain to you how it happens. I only know that it does. And for those of you that may not know Jesus Christ, there's a, there's a word of confusion in your heart and in your mind too. Can I really believe? Can I really trust? Let me tell you something. This man named Saul, he gets a new name. And his name becomes Paul. And Paul becomes the apostle of the Gentile church. Apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament that we love, that we preach, that we teach. I've often, I've often told people who are wondering about their own salvation. Sometimes they'll tell me, Preacher, you don't know what I've done. I think God cannot save me. My answer to them is always, God, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know the sins that I've committed. And I can tell you, if He can forgive me, He can forgive anyone. But Paul used to be Saul. And Saul hated Christ. And he hated anything that was in Christ. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth. And he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Oh, what would it have been like to have been there that day and to have witnessed that? To have been off the side of the road, maybe behind the sin, maybe up in a sycamore tree like Zacchaeus was, trying to hide himself. You know, you can't hide from God. Lord, don't let me start preaching that. I'll get off on a, a tangent. Maybe, maybe, maybe put yourself in that scene. Be very quiet. There's something big happening in the life of Saul. You don't want to make an interruption. You don't want to mess up what's happening here in the heart of this man that Jesus is dealing with. But put yourself in the scene. Stand behind a tree. Maybe over a hill. Wouldn't you love to have been there and to have seen such a powerful move of God? You've seen it right here in this church. After the sermon is preached and the song is being played and the altar is open, you've seen the Holy Spirit. You've seen Jesus cry out to someone, Saul, Saul. Maybe, maybe, maybe you didn't hear Saul. Maybe you heard Chad. Chad. Maybe, maybe you heard Bill. Bill! But you heard something. You seen something. And you knew that Jesus was moving. You knew that Jesus was working. You knew that Jesus was touching someone. And you knew that some, at any moment now, someone is going to have a coming to Jesus moment. 
And so you've opened your eyes. Oh, I've told you I want every head to be bowed. I want every eye to be closed. I don't want anybody looking around. But you can hear what's happening. You know Jesus is moving. And it's falling on someone. And you've just got to see. So first you look up at me to see if I'm watching. And when I'm not watching, your eyes fix upon me. And you see the power that the Lord has in a person's life. And then you begin thinking to yourself, if he's got that kind of power for soul, he's got that kind of power for me. And the next thing you hear is, Rose, Rose, Laura, Laura. As he begins to call one by one those of you who are seeing the light of the Lord fall from you. Oh, I would. I would that we could go enter into a time with Jesus where that light just floods us again. Where we could turn every light off in this beautiful sanctuary and it would still be illuminated because Jesus is the light of heaven. And He illuminates people. He allows us to see. He allows us to hear. He allows us to understand the things that we've never been able to see or never been able to hear or never been able to understand. What's happening with Saul is a beautiful thing. He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he fell to the earth. And he said, look at verse number five. Who art thou, Lord? What a question. What a beautiful question. I want to hone in today on verse number five. I'm not going to keep reading. I'm going to stop at verse number five. Because I want to hone in on two things. I want to hone in on the question, Who are you, Lord? And I want to hone in on the answer, I am Jesus. Mm. And I want us to have this dialogue in our hearts and in our spirits today. Some of you know who Jesus is. Some of you need to be reminded who Jesus is. Some of you have never known who Jesus is. So I'm going to hone in on the question. Who are you, Lord? And then I want us to visit the answer. I am Jesus. Verse 5. So, so, so the light fell. It shone round about him. And it was a light from heaven. That had to have been a bright light. Do you know in heaven there is no need for the moon? Or no need for the sun? Or no need for the stars? Yeah. In heaven we don't need the moon to light the sky in the nighttime. In heaven we don't need the sun to light the sky in the daytime. We don't need the light from the stars that twinkle above our homes. The Bible says there's no need for the sun or the moon or the stars. For Jesus is the light of heaven. Jesus illuminates it. What a brightness. You remember when, when, when he and, and Peter and James and John were up on the mountain of transfiguration? And how in a moment Jesus' countenance had changed and he was glowing. He was bright. There was a light that was shining out from him. And it was so powerful that Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. <coughs> Let me tell you, it's good for you to be in the light of the Lord. For the things that are causing darkness in your life, lean into the light. For the things that are causing confusion in your world, lean into the light. You're a child of light. You're no longer a child of darkness. And the darkness cannot comprehend the light. My friends, stand flat-footed and firm in the light. And that light being Jesus Christ. Ooh, I'm going to get ahead of myself and preach the message. Holy Spirit, so. That light fell on him. He fell to the ground. He heard the voice of the Lord call him by name. And then verse 5, one of the most powerful moments in Scripture, for me anyway, is, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? Who art thou? Who are you, Lord? 
And Jesus said, I am Jesus. Let that sink in. Whom thou persecutest, it is hard for thee to kick against the prayers. Saul says, Who are you, Lord? Jesus said, I'm Jesus. Simple question, simple answer. Today we need to ask the simple questions. And we need to believe in the simple answer. It was a simple question, but the answer is so profound and powerful as today as it was back then. And today it is still powerful and profound as it was back then. The answer changed Saul's life. Saul was no longer Saul, but Saul received a brand new name. He became Apostle Paul. Paul knew the name, but he didn't know the Lord. Think about that. He knew the name, but he didn't know the Lord. But once he knew the Lord, once Paul, once the light of Jesus Christ and the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ fell upon Paul, Paul was bought by the blood in that moment, in that instant, as soon as Christ revealed himself to Saul and Saul humbled himself under the mighty hand of God and cried out to Jesus. In that moment, in that instant, Saul was bought by the blood of the Lamb of God. And today... Today, if you're in Christ and Christ is in you, you are only in Christ because you have been bought with a price. And that price is the precious blood of the Lamb. The answer changed Paul's life because Paul had now been bought by the blood. Paul had now been filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul had been given a new life, a new direction, a new purpose, and a new name. And so it is with every believer. With every believer. The book of Romans teaches us that if you would believe in thy heart, that if you would confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. There's not, there's not anything to add to. Anything outside of the gospel is man-made. If man-made is not good enough to save your soul, we need Jesus. We need to know who the Lord is. This is coming from the man who wrote the words. I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That came, that came through the hand of the Apostle Paul, who once was Saul. Who once didn't know Jesus. But once he came to know Jesus, it gave him a new lease. It gave, didn't give him a new lease on life. It gave him a brand new life. A life that was bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. Do you know what? Salvation won't cost you one thin dime. You couldn't buy it even if you wanted to. It's not for sale. Freely. Freely you receive. Freely you should give. The gospel is free. The gospel of Jesus Christ is free. There are so many people that are making money off of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our world today. Preacher, would you come and speak at our church? Yes. I'll send my attorneys ahead of me. You can fill out the contracts and, and, and it'll be... It, I'm going to charge you $1,000 an hour, but I'd gladly come and preach it. Of course you'd gladly come and preach the gospel. It's not really a gospel. Listen, salvation is absolutely free. It doesn't cost you a thin dime. Jesus paid the price on Calvary's cross. Pastor Thad, why are you preaching a salvation message to the church? Because it is the power of God unto salvation to those who are lost. But unto those of us who are saved, it's also the power of God to raise us up and to strengthen us and to edify us and to lead us and guide us and to remind us who it is that we serve. Paul said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. Uh, who is the Lord? I'll tell you who the Lord is. The Lord is the Savior of the world. Praise His holy name. Mm. In the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 20 through 
21. If you're taking notes, write this down. Matthew 1, 20 through 21. The angel Gabriel comes to a man named Joseph who is a spouse to a woman named Mary. And they had never been together. And Mary was a virgin. But Mary had to go to Joseph and tell Joseph that I am with child. But listen to me, Joseph. I didn't cheat on you. The, that holy thing that is in my belly has been put there by the Holy Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. Joseph did what most of you men would do. He didn't believe that. I heard Laura witnessing the Lord One of our students the other day, as she was telling her, that you just have to believe. You just have to have faith. That's her heart. She just simply believes. She simply has faith. And I've taught you before that faith needs no explanation. Faith needs no answer. If you have an answer for it, if you have an explanation for it, then it becomes intellect and it's no longer faith. Faith doesn't always have to have an answer. Just, just gotta believe. And I heard her say, yeah, there are some things in the scripture that's hard to believe, but you just have to believe them. And isn't that the truth? Amen. There are some things, come on, in the flesh, in our intellect, there's some things that are just hard Amen. to believe. Like, come on, did that really happen? Yes. The answer to that is yes. The virgin birth of Christ is one of those things that challenges the fleshly person. How can this thing be? Even Mary said, how can this thing be? Seeing I've never known a man. But the light of the Lord shone upon Mary, and Mary believed it. I'm not preaching to you a Christmas message. I'm getting to a point. Mary went to Joseph, and she explained to Joseph everything that happened. And according to the Scripture, Joseph, being a just man, and not willing to see her be stoned to death, but rather chose to put her away privately, Joseph was going to end the marriage. That tells me Joseph did not believe her story. And wouldn't that be a hard one to believe? But it was true. And it was so true that Jesus dispatched Gabriel, and Gabriel went to Joseph and told Joseph, Fear not to take unto thee thy wife, <clears throat> for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus. And he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus is the Savior of the world. But who is his people? His people is whosoever will come to him. He shall in no wise cast out. John 3.16 answers that question. Who is his people? John 3.16 said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus is the Savior of the world. And I don't care if you're white. I don't care if you're black. I don't care if you're red. I don't care if you're yellow. I don't care if you live in China. I don't care if you live in Indonesia. I don't care if you live in the United States of America. If you are a living, breathing soul, Jesus Christ is your Savior. I don't care how bad you've been. I don't care how many sins you've committed. I don't care if your hair is long. I don't care if your hair is short. I don't care if you dress in the finest of clothes or if you have to go from yard sale to yard sale just to clothe your back. It don't matter to me what you drive or what kind of house you live in. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And to whomsoever shall seek His face and call upon Him, the Bible says they shall be saved. Time is drawing near. Time is getting away. I believe with all of my heart that at any time our eastern skies are going to split. That there's going to be a trumpet sound so loud that the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
and those of us who are alive and remain will be changed in the moment of a twinkling of an eye. I believe that the calling up of the church, I believe that the catching up of the church, I believe that the rapture of the church, whatever term you want to use, I believe that that time is drawing nigh. And I believe that the Holy Spirit of God is pouring its spirit out upon all flesh. I believe our sons and our daughters are going to rise up and prophesy. I believe that our old men are going to see visions and our young men will dream dreams. I believe that the Word of God is coming to pass right before our very eyes. And it's time to go back to a simplicity of preaching who Jesus is. Your soul, my soul, the soul of our children and of our grandchildren depend on it. Who is the Lord? The Lord is the Savior of the world. And He came to save His people from their sins. And who is His people? According to John 3.16, it's the world. It don't matter who you are. Jesus is your Savior. <coughs> who is the Lord? The Lord is your Savior. The Lord is the Lord of all. Point number two. Point number one was Jesus is the Savior. Point number two is that Jesus is the Lord of all. That's who He is. He's the Lord of all. And He's the Lord over all. Somebody needs to listen to this point. I feel so powerfully in my spirit that this point is going to bless someone here today. Matthew 28, 18 says, All power, Jesus says, All power in heaven and in earth has been given unto me. Friend, there is nothing that escapes His Lordship. There's no pain. There's no sickness. There's no poverty. There's no brokenness. You serve a Lord that has unlimited power. And whatever your need is today, Jesus is the Lord over that. Or He can be. He can be. Consider this. All power. Say that with me. All power. All power. Say it again. All One more time. All. All. <clears throat> See? That encompasses everything. That encompasses every aspect. That encompasses everything. All power in heaven and in earth has been given to Christ. That makes him the final authority in the life of a believer. Are you a believer? Shout in here. Amen. Say it again. Amen. 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 Say, I believe. I believe. Say it again. I believe. If you're a believer, then you are covered under the authority of the Lord of Lords. He's the Lord of all. He's the Lord over all. So whatever your need is today, He has the power and the authority over that need. Well, how come I ain't seeing nothing like that? Okay, see? There's, we get back to that simple message that Laura has taught all of our children. And she's teaching our grandchildren. A simple message of faith and belief. Well, God, Jesus said, obviously isn't the Lord over this in my life because this never changes. I'm going to help you here with something. Sometimes people tell me that you shouldn't meddle. And I, I beg to differ. God called me to meddle. If I don't meddle, then I won't stir you. And if I don't stir you, you won't be changed. And nothing changes. Everything remains the same. So all these things that you got in your life that are going really, 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 really good. The things that you wake up every morning and praise God for. This, this is going good. And I praise you, Lord, because this is going good. And I praise you, God, because this is going good. But Lord, yeah. You want to know why all these things are going good? Because at some point in your life, you were moved by the Spirit through faith to come to an altar like this one. And one by one, lay those things on an altar and just surrender them to Jesus. You have made Him the Lord over those things in your life. The things that He's not lording over in your life is because you are trying to be the Lord of them. I know that's harsh. I know that's straightforward. 
but I love you. Mm. I love you enough to be truthful with you. There's nothing impossible with our Lord. There's no burden too heavy that He can't carry it. There's no sickness so harsh that He can't heal it. There's no sin so wicked that He cannot save it. There's no child so lost that He can't reach it. He's the Lord over all. I had you say it with me. So the things that you have given to Him to be Lord over, how good are those things going for you? Those are the things you show up every Sunday morning and you testify to the goodness of the Lord. Oh, He's so good. He's so good about this. He's so good about that. He's so good about this. He's so good about that. You're faithful and I love you for it. Continue praising Him. Continue giving Him the honor. Continue giving Him the glory. He's the Lord over that in your life. It's those problem areas. It's those struggles. It's those, man, I try so hard, but I just can't. It's because you don't have all power in heaven and in earth. It's because you're limited. It's because you're in the flesh, and the flesh is weak. The spirit is strong. Let him be Lord over that in your life. And then he'll be Lord over that. Jesus. Who is Jesus? Who are you, Lord? Well, I'm the Savior of the world. Who are you, Lord? I'm the Lord. Amen. What a blessing. She's here to call of God. Suffer the little children coming to me. For I'm such a king of death. She's all right, sis. I've been raising babies for a long time. Oh, that blesses me. Okay, point number three. We're going to make this one and then we're going to close. Paul said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus. I am saying I am Jesus. That's him saying that he is the Savior of the world, that he is the Lord over all. And point number three, who is the Lord? The Lord is the way. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Hear me today, my friend, when you're lost and you can't find your way, seek Jesus. I'm going to say that again. It's powerful. When you're lost and you can't find your way, seek Jesus. In sin, He is the way out. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're watching over the internet. And maybe sin has torn your life upside down and inside out. I understand. I've been there. And when you're caught, when you're trapped, when you're lost in your sin, you can feel so much despair. You can feel so much heaviness. But Jesus is your way out. So many people who are lost in sin are searching for a way out. And they try to find it through drugs. They try to find it through alcohol. They try to find it through relationships. They try to find it through so many different avenues. But I'm here today to tell you that there is a way that seemeth right into a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. You'll never, you'll never drink enough to fill that void in your soul. You'll never take, find a drug powerful enough to heal that hole, that brokenness that's inside your heart. The only way out is Jesus. And He stands before you with outstretched arms saying, Come unto Me. Come unto Me. Come unto Me, all ye that are labored and heavy laden, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. Lost soul today, there's a rest for you, and that rest is in Jesus Christ. If you're in trouble... He is ever present in a time of trouble. How many times have you prayed, Lord, would you come down here into this circumstance and take control? Lord, I don't know about this situation. I've done everything I know to do, and it won't change. Will you come down into here? Will you bring the comfort? Will you send the comfort? Will you come down here and show me the way? How many times have we prayed God into our circumstance or situation? You need to pray. 
through all your circumstances and situations, but I want to bless someone else some truth today. You don't have to ask God to come into your circumstance or your situation. According to the scripture, God is already there. That should comfort someone. He is the way. He's the way when you're in sin. He's the way when you're in trouble. He's the way when you're confused. He's the way through. How many of you have ever felt confusion? How many of you have never known what to do? Or wouldn't know what to do? Even if you wouldn't know how to do it, even if you knew what to do. Jesus is the way through. The psalmist wrote, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Jesus is that way through. Praise His holy name. When you're broken, He's the restorer. When you're sick, He's the healer. When you're scared, He's the encourager. When you're sad, He's the comforter. When you're in need, He's the provider. Any other way is a wrong turn. Any other way is a wrong turn. Jesus Christ is the way. And He's the only way. Listen, Paul asked the right question. Paul asked the right question <clears throat> on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians and to shut down the church. The whole Jesus visited him. He shined his light upon him. Knocked him off his beast down to the ground. And he called him by name. Today, you know who you are. Jesus has already spoke to you. I, I, know, I know the power that I felt this morning as this began to flood my soul. Jesus didn't sit here to preach this message so that I could practice and hone in on my skill of preaching. The messages are sent because somebody needs to hear them. And that somebody is sitting right in here or watching right now over the internet. And you've heard him call your name. Saul heard him call his name. Someone in here, there is something in this message that you heard that's stuck in your heart. And you heard Jesus say, Mark, this is for you. You heard Jesus say, Courtney, this is for you. You heard Jesus say, Laura, remember that point? This is for you. Now, when Saul heard that, he asked the right question. Who are you? And he got the right answer. I'm Jesus. Somebody in here today needs to not only ask the right question, but you need to hear the right answer. Jesus is still Jesus. Jesus is still saving. Jesus is still blessing. Jesus is still providing the way. Jesus is still healing. Jesus is still taking care. Jesus is still reaching our children. He's still reaching our children's children. Jesus. Jesus. Let him. Let him Lord over those things in your life. I feel like I've preached my message. Let's rise to our feet. Every head to be bowed. Every eye to be closed. There's no one looking around this church right now. There's no one that can see you. Only me and the Holy Spirit. Is there a lost soul in our midst today? Is there one of you here? You know the name, but you don't know the Savior. You know the name, but you don't know Him as Lord. You know the name, but you don't know Him as the way. Maybe you're here in the congregation today and that you, my friend, there is no shame in step, stepping up and stepping up for Jesus Christ. Is that you here today? 
Preacher, I've been coming to church here a long time. What is everybody going to think about me? Nobody's going to think nothing about you. And if they do, they need to follow you to the altar because they're as lost as a person as <coughs> everybody else helps me. Would you come? Would you come? What a beautiful song. Amazing grace. God's grace is so amazing. Maybe you're over the internet and you're saying, Preacher, you can't see me. But I need to be saved. Open your heart. Give it to the Lord. Tell Him you believe He's the Son of God. Tell Him you believe He died in your place. Tell Him you believe He resurrected to give you hope of eternal life. Repent of your sins. Turn from Him. Lay Him down at Jesus' feet. Follow Him through faith. According to the Word of God, you'll be saved. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're over the internet watching and you are saved. There's things in your life that you want Jesus to lord over. It's hard for you to let go. But you're going to lay him down at Jesus' feet. Is that you? Amen. Amen.